Hello guys, got a video here for you today on the BSA R10. Now in this one what we're going to be doing is giving the rifle a little tune. We've got some upgrade parts to fit to the rifle and I'll also run through some of the things we've done to the R10 to make it a nicer rifle to shoot. Before we begin though I do just want to say that there is tons of different ways to tune rifles and this is by no means the best or the only way you can do it. And in this video we're just going to be showing the way we do things. But with all that being said, what I'll do is just run through some of the changes that we've made to this rifle already. I have already showed these changes on video, but I'll just recap them here. So the first thing we've done is fit a 177, roughly 17 inch barrel to this rifle. This is one of the FX smooth twist barrels before the liners. So it's got a slightly different and longer barrel than factory. We've also already fitted the humor regulator to this rifle. But if you wanted to see more on those two items, we did do videos on them on the channel. Right then, and the first area that we're going to look at is the trigger. So, we'll get that off and I'll show you what exactly we do to the triggers to make them a little nicer. The first thing we'll do is remove the trigger set entirely. That's done by simply using a 3mm Allen key in these two screws here. So the first thing we'll have a look at in the trigger is the trigger sears themselves. These have been given a good polish so that they're nice and smooth. Hopefully the camera will pick that up nicely. So this one at the top here arrests the hammer. And when we pull the trigger obviously that allows the sear to fall down and the hammer flies forward. This one needs to be nice and smooth. The hammer rides up it and then latches on the top of it. So the smoother that you can make that surface, the better the hammer's going to run up it. I will also show you the part that mates against this. And they both need to be polished up nice and smooth so that they work with each other rather than fighting against each other. But that's the first sear there. You can remove these sears by just removing these pins here. I won't take them out as this trigger's already been set and is nicely finished. The other thing that we've done is remove some material from the corner so that the safety still works and we have a nice short first stage. The first stage on these triggers can be a bit long from the factory so we took a bit of material off the back there so that the trigger can be adjusted up where we like it and so the safety can still work. So the safety still works on this rifle but we have a very very short nice first stage. Now you've got to be very very careful when you do this as you can go too far so that the safety no longer works. If you take it too far what will happen is you'll still be able to pull the trigger but it won't actually stop or the safety won't actually stop the trigger from being pulled. So just be very careful if you decide to do that yourself. The last thing that I'll point out on this trigger is that the this part here has been shimmed. If you take a look in there you can just about see a plastic shim washer there. It's been shimmed to stop the this part here from rocking from side to side. This does two things. It makes the trigger feel nicer, more solid, less wobbly, and it also makes it a little more reliable as the trigger pin here can no longer twist. And as this part here is directly connected to one of the sears, the less movement, so side to side movement that you have in that, the more reliable the trigger will be. So shimming it in the sides there is a very, very worthwhile operation. Again, if you need to get it out, just bang the pins out there. Not normally that tight from the factory, if I'm honest. But that's all the things that we've done to this trigger. Now, while we're talking about triggers, I do just want to mention that you have to be very careful when you're changing or polishing the triggers. If you take certain surfaces too far, it can cause the trigger to stop latching. The idea and goal of polishing a trigger is to remove as little material as possible in order to get the finish that you're looking for. And as such, you should really only be using very, very fine sandpaper. So starting at something like 800 grit and then working your way up to 2000 grit, going through the grits nice and evenly, then finishing off with auto sole or metal polish. I have seen people put uh, replacement trigger weight springs in. So this spring in the front here is your trigger weight. So I have seen people put replacement springs in, but I've really never found the need to go that far. Once the sears have been polished and a little bit of work's been done to the trigger, I've never found the need to replace the trigger weight spring. With that all said, we'll put the trigger to one side. And the last part that's related to the trigger is this little pin down here. So we'll take this out in a minute and take a good, better look at it. As you can see there, this has been polished as well. 
So this is the cocking mechanism for the hammer and as this comes back the trigger sear latches onto it and arrests it back. Then obviously when you fire the rifle, pull the trigger, this flies forward and the hammer, which is in there, hits the valve. So hopefully you can see that there. But when we polish this, we make it nice and smooth so that it runs on the sear very nicely. If it's rough, it will obviously be rough on the sear. And the smoother you can get everything to run across each other, the better it's going to feel. Right then, with the trigger out of the way, we can start talking about some of the things we're going to try and improve on the rifle. The first being shot cam. Now, the standard Sub 12 R10 is set up fairly poorly from the factory, as it has a relatively large and heavy hammer and a soft but long hammer spring. What this does is create the perfect environment for hammer bounce. So, very basically, the hammer is always being pushed against the valve by the hammer spring. And if we imagine the hammer set up in the rifle like so, when we cock it, it brings it back. And then when we fire the rifle, it flies forward, hits the valve and opens it, allowing a puff of air out, which pushes a pellet down the end of the barrel. Now in a perfect world, that's where the equation would stop. However, what happens in the R10 is that the hammer hits the valve, rebounds back and compresses the hammer spring. What then happens is the hammer spring fires the hammer forward again, and it keeps doing that, bouncing against the valve, wasting some air. Now obviously it doesn't happen continuously, but even bouncing three or four times wasting air, each shot can add up. Now we're not going to remove hammer bounce entirely, but we can help it by fitting a turned down hammer or a lightened hammer and a heavier and shorter hammer spring. So this is a hammer that I've made and a hammer spring. This is a FAC BSA hammer spring for the R10 that's been cut down to around 35 or 36 millimeters. And we're going to be fitting both of these parts in the back there in place of the BSA originals. Whilst we've got the gunner part as well, we're going to be fitting a stainless steel pellet probe. So this is another item that I've made and that just replaces the BSA original part. The BSA original part is chrome plated and the plating normally flakes off and leaves debris inside the action. A stainless steel one, obviously no coating, so it just goes in there and is a direct replacement and you no longer get the silver flaky coating inside your rifle. However, the stainless steel pellet probe won't actually give us any more shots or make the rifle any more accurate. And if you didn't want to get a stainless steel probe, you could just remove the coating from the original probe and it'll be fine. The stainless steel one's just a nicer option. However, I'll be fitting both parts. So the first thing we're going to do is remove this back cap here. My one's already loose as I've had it off before. But we did discuss in the full disassembly how to remove these if your one's Loctited on. The next thing we're going to do is remove the bolt handle. So that's just using a 3mm Allen key in the back here. Then we're going to remove this screw here using a flat bladed screwdriver. And then using a 3mm Allen key, we're just going to go in the hole there and loosen the screw. This will allow the back cap to fly off, so just keep an eye on that. There we have it there. We can then pull the hammer spring out and the hammer weight. Yours might not be fitted with a hammer weight, but my one was from factory. Stick those pieces to the side, tip out the screw, or poke it out. There it comes there. Next thing we'll do is reinstall the probe handle, then cock it like so, and then coming in from this side. What we're going to do is gently push this section here back, exposing this screw here. Once that's done, keep a good firm grip of the action and loosen this screw here. That's using a 3mm Allen key. There's the screw there. Once both screws are out, the two halves of the block can be separated nice and carefully as there is a number of springs and ball bearings under here. So just be very careful as you take the top piece off the bottom piece. And as you can see there, we've got an O-ring. 
that just goes over the transfer bolt. While we're here, we'll just replace the pellet probe first. So first thing we're going to do, using a two and a half mil Allen key, just loosen the banjo bolt and remove the screw. And then by putting something thin in the hole of the banjo bolt there, we can hold that in place and pull the pellet probe back. There's the banjo bolt there. Stick that to one side. Remove the spring for the ball detent on the pellet probe. The ball's still in there, however, when we pull that out. But we can just push that through and then tip it out. There it is there. Now that's done. We can just slide the pellet probe out of the sheath there. And remove the bolt handle by using a 3mm Allen key in the back again. There we have it there. So that's the old one. This is the new stainless steel one. So this one here is the stainless one. This one here is the original. So to make it a little easier to handle, we'll just put the cocking handle back on or the bolt probe and then put in a small amount of lithium grease on the outside of the pellet probe. That'll just make it move a little easier in the shuttle. Then we can slide the Delwyn shuttle over it, like so. Then put that in the back of the rifle. Before we push that all the way in, I've just got our banjo bolt here. I'm going to put that in the rifle. It's a little hard to show for the camera. But we're just going to hook that over the pellet probe and then push the pellet probe forward. Like so. Then we can get the hole lined up with the hole in the banjo bolt and drop the bolt through. Doing that up with a two and a half mil Allen key. Next up we can just drop the ball bearing back in the hole. Now I have put a little bit of lithium grease over this. So put it in the back there. Push it in, and then finally top that off with a spring. Again, just with a little bit of lithium grease over the spring. And there we have it. So we've got some work to do on the back part, or the bottom part I should say. So we'll just stick this to the one side for now, and then we'll bring it back in a minute. So we'll bring back the bottom part. We'll flip it up like so. And then in the back here we have a grub screw that we need to remove. That's done using a 3mm Allen key. We don't need to take it out all the way for now, just a few turns loose. And that will allow us to bring this trigger pin out. And we should just be able to tip the hammer assembly out. So at this point we can just push the old hammer out. We have this red insulating piece here that pops out. And then the hammer which is this part here. Right then, so I've got all the hammer parts laid out here. We have the old hammer here, which we're just going to put to one side in a minute. But we have the new lightened hammer here. See, if we take a look at them side by side, we see a quite a lot of material removed from the lightened one. We also see the standard hammer spring here. Well, this is the standard BSA Sub-12 soft hammer spring. We also have the FAC harder one here as well. So as you can see, the FAC one is the longest, the sub-12 one is slightly shorter, and then R1 we've cut down even shorter. So our hammer spring is about 35mm in length, and that's the length that we've found works quite well. So we'll stick all the parts we're not using to one side, and we're left with the parts that we're going to reinstall. So if we look at here, we have a spring guard for the back cap, we have a spring guard for the front that goes on the inside of this plastic part here. We obviously have our shortened hammer spring, lightened hammer and our trigger pin. So before we put the hammer back in the rifle, we are just going to take a look at this tube here. Hopefully the camera will pick that up, but this tube has been honed by us. We've uh, polished the inside of that. And that's just so that the 
Hammer Spring Shuttle flies around in it nice and smoothly. But this is obviously plastic, so it does have some bearing surface in there, but it flies up and down very smoothly now that this has been honed. From the factory, there was quite a few burrs and things inside there where the holes had been drilled through, but not had the sharp edges broken. And we've also polished the sides of these slots here. So if the hammer does ever touch them, or the hammer pin rattles against them, it isn't rattling against a rough surface. So it's nice and smooth in there as well. Now all of these little jobs, such as the polishing of the trigger, the polishing of the inside of the rifle, all that sort of thing, are cumulative. Just doing one piece on its own might not make a tremendous amount of difference. However, when you combine all the little changes, that's when you see the big difference. But with all that being said, we can start on the reinstallation of these parts here. First thing we're going to do is just drop the hammer into the back here, align the hole, and put that through. Take our trigger pin, put that through the hole like so. This does obviously have a flap for a grub screw on the back there, which needs to be aligned with the back of the rifle. And if we take a look at it, this flat section here goes points upwards, and this shaped section down the bottom obviously points downwards towards the trigger. Next up, we can drop our securing grub screw in the back, and then using a 3mm Allen key, just do that up. Obviously aligning the flat of the trigger pin with the hole in the back. So the grub screw tightens onto it. But once our hammer's in, we can push that all the way forward and we'll bring back the trigger. We'll put the trigger on first as it's a little easier to adjust everything with the top block not installed. So, what we do, drop the trigger on top, like so. And then install the two screws that secure it on using a 3mm Allen key. Once the front one's on, we do obviously have to drop the spring and the spring guide in the back there. So as you can see there, we're using a little Delrin spring guide that replaces the hammer weight that we took out earlier. But we'll just drop that in the back of the rifle and then drop over the back cap, like so. And then getting the safety out of the way, we can realign the trigger, dropping the screw in for the back cap, and then doing that up with a 3mm Allen key. I will mention that the back cap does have two sized holes in it. The larger of the two goes to the bottom. For now though, we can just test that the trigger is still working. So we're on safe there now at the moment. But everything seems to be working okay. This trigger still feels nice. If we needed to make any changes to this part here, we could do so by just going in the back and adjusting accordingly. The pin itself obviously does have a small amount of up and down movement. And if it's not in the right place, sometimes the trigger stops working or you can't cock the rifle. But where it's set now, it seems to be perfectly fine. The last thing we will do is just take a look in the back here remove the hammer spring adjuster and then refit it with the little PTFE spring guide washer that we've got that fits in the back there. All that does is just make sure that the spring, which has been polished, rotates nice and freely on a nice guide. Again, one of those things that doesn't make much of a difference on its own, but when you add it to a bunch of other changes, it can make the difference. There we go, we'll leave the hammer spring adjuster there for now and we'll fine adjust it when we actually get everything built back up. But with that done, we can bring back the top half of the rifle and get the two halves married together. Making sure that we've got all our springs and balls in place. So the spring and the ball bearing in this section here, which connects to the magazine release. And also the one in the back here for the ball detent on the ballot probe. We've also got the four millimeter transfer port installed with the O-ring pre-installed on it. So we'll stick the two halves together, making sure that the pellet probe is all the way forward as the cocking dog needs to be on the front side 
of the hammer pin, obviously. Like so. Pushing both halves together nice and firmly. At this stage, we'll pull the pellet probe back, which has exposed this hole here. We can then drop this screw in, tightening it down with a three millimeter Allen key. It's got the two halves locked together. We can then push the pellet probe forward again and just teasing all the bits in place. So there we have it there. With that done, we'll remove the bolt handle. So that's using a three millimeter Allen key. Then reinstalling the screw in the back here. Again with a three millimeter Allen key. Once that's done, we can put the bolt handle back on. Getting in rough position for now, we can always adjust it when it's in the stock. And then dropping this little cover piece on here. Doing that up with a flat bladed screwdriver. And then there we have it. The rifle's all put back together. We can get it gassed up, put back in the stock and test it. Right then, so we've concluded our testing and I'm quite happy with how things turned out. The modifications we did inside the rifle did improve the shot count. And whilst the accuracy was very good before, it's become a little more consistent now that we've done a little more work inside the rifle. Now fitting the stainless steel pellet probe and fitting the lightened hammer shouldn't really have an effect on accuracy. We might see the accuracy get a little better with a lightened hammer, as in my testings, fitting the lightened hammer and heavier hammer spring reduced the extreme spread. And that's obviously going to have a little bit of an effect downrange. But what I'll do is put the before and after shot strings on the video now so you can see what happens when we fit the two pieces. And I'm quite happy with the results. We successfully managed to increase the shot count and reduced slightly the extreme spread. Now the thing that I do want to point out is the exact numbers of shot counts we are getting with this R10 now. Now if you look on the BSA website you'll see some astronomical shot count figures of sort of 190 that sort of thing. And to this day I haven't seen an R10 out of the box that will replicate these figures. I really don't know what those figures are trying to claim. But certainly the dozen or so R10s that I've had and seen over the years, none of them out of the box have been anywhere close to what BSA claim. So the initial shot count of this rifle was about 120, 130 at top whack from a 200 bar fill. And since we've fitted the lightened hammer and heavier hammer spring, that's jumped up a bit to just under 200. And for those interested, the reg on this rifle was set to around 80 bar. Although that's obviously with my longer barrel. So I have a 17 inch barrel on this rifle. And that's obviously a little longer than the standard BSA barrels. Now we could do a little more to increase the shot count. We could play around with the hammer. Shorten the stroke maybe. Put some packers in the valve return spring. That sometimes boosts the shot count up a little. But my goal with this rifle was to pretty much pick the low hanging fruit. Gain the most amount of improvement with the least amount of work. And I think we've done that pretty successfully. Right then, so with that all being said, what I thought we'd do at the very end of the video was just go through some of the theory on some of the ideas that we had with this rifle. I'll start with the setting of the reg pressure. So to find the set pressure of the regulator, what we did was set the reg overly high, so around 150, that sort of thing. Got the rifle shooting to around 700 feet per second and then shot the rifle down. Using a chronograph, we could see when the rifle spiked in FPS. We could then have a look at the gauge on the bottom of the rifle and roughly set the regulator to where the rifle was at the highest power. On our rifle, that turned out to be around 80 bar. Once we had found sort of 80 bar, we tested the rifle, different pellets at 80 bar, upped it to around 85 and lowered it to around 75 and picked sort of where the best spot was for accuracy and that obviously gives you a jumping off point for your regulator you can go up a little bit you can come down a little bit just have a play with it as for the lightened hammer and heavier hammer spring that's just something that we've sort of found over time we knew going into this that around 35 millimeters was going to be our spring length with the chosen hammer weight a shorter barreled rifle so something like a 12 inch or even a 9 inch barrel 
might benefit from a higher reg pressure, a slightly heavier hammer and probably a slightly longer hammer spring. Obviously the shorter you make your barrel, the less efficient your rifle is going to be. And as such you need to make sort of little sacrifices here and there. And as for spring length, the ideal, absolute ideal scenario would be to have the hammer with no preload. So the valve and the hammer not pressing against each other. If you can cut the spring short enough to achieve that so that there's only a little bit, sort of a millimetre, half a millimetre free play in the hammer so that it's not being pressed up against the valve, that's where the rifle is going to be most efficient. Now in this rifle we wasn't able to achieve that. We did have to put a little bit of preload on the valve and as such the shot count is going to suffer from that. But it's obviously a trade-off as we did want to be shooting at around 780 feet per second. And that's using 844 pellets. The other little things in the rifle, so polishing of the internals, polishing of the trigger, the spring guides, all that sort of thing, are real little changes that you can make to the rifle that might not on their own provide a tangible benefit. But when you sort of group them all up, do them all at one time, you can definitely tell the difference between a rifle that's had the trigger polished and one that hasn't. That's the same for spring guides and all that sort of thing. You're not necessarily going to see a dramatic drop in feet per second extreme spread, although it does provide an environment within the gun that's going to give it the best possible chance to perform how it should do. But that's it for me talking about the rifle and certain things. The last thing I want to show you is just the groups that we did with the rifle. Right then, so here's the groups we done with the rifle. At the top here, or on this side of the paper, we have my zero in and pellet testing groups. On this side of the line we have our final pellet and the groups that we did with that pellet, all at 50 yards obviously. We did try at 30 yards but they just was going through the same hole so we had to step it out to 50 to make a difference. But as you can see some real nice tight groups from the BSA. These circles here are around 25mm in diameter, probably a little less, 24 something like that. And some of these groups are really quite tight. So if we look at that one there probably an edge to edge of around 10.5 millimeters. So this is a 177 rifle. And center to center, that'd be around a six mil center to center group. For a 50 yard shooting though, a five pence piece is probably the best way of telling if your rifle is a good one. If all five pellets, these are five shot groups, if all five pellets are under a five pence piece, then you've got a really good rifle at 50 yards. So as you can see, Probably all or most of these groups are under five pence piece, with the only ones being sort of this one and probably this one that are over that. So the barrel's definitely working as it should, and the pellets that we ended up shooting through this rifle were JSB shorts. Right then, with that all being said, that's going to about do it for this video. So thank you for watching, I'll see you in the next one.